Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ogden Museum of Southern, I, uh, Southern Art, Louisiana Contemporary 2020 panel discussion. I'm glad to see everyone here. I'm scrolling through our attendees here to make sure um, we have a good gathering. I appreciate your being together today. Um, our, our concept is pretty simple, like the exhibition itself. We wanted to talk about the work that we are seeing in, uh, in the exhibition and the artists that produce it and get a perspective by our jurors. So we will begin that process. Um, we are taking questions and comments later on in the chat. Please see that um, I think you can pull that up. And when you write a question um, at, the, at the moment, I guess we'll call for them, that we'll see them come up and we'll select from those questions that are coming in. Certainly ones that we get more than once, we'll try and get to sooner. Uh, you, there is no need to record, audio record or photograph the, uh, or live stream the Zoom that we're doing because it will be archived and placed on the Ogden Museum and will be available in a variety of places. So, so thank you for that. I want to first thank our presenting sponsors for Louisiana Contemporary 2020, the Ellis Foundation. Uh, and their president, Dave Erstein, and managing director. It almost feels like it's a foregone conclusion. Is it this every year? Of things that we thought were efficient. Um, and our juror, Renee Morales, who's joining us today, is um, director of curatorial affairs and the chief curator at the Perez Art Museum, Miami. And as custom, we uh, have joining us um, also today, David Breslin, who was the juror for Louisiana Contemporary uh, in 2019. And is, A is in Miami, David is here. Many of us are here in New Orleans. I'm very happy to be getting us together and also joined Dove Brunoir and Nick Aziz. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank, before we get into the questions, I want to thank Amy Newell, who is with us as the host of this virtual gathering. Um, and Amy did a fantastic job as exhibition specialist in Ogden Museum. This is um, uh, some a project that she's passionate about. She put so much energy into it and makes it personal and, and has connectivity, a deep amount of connectivity and engagement with the artist community that we seek to represent annually on the walls of the museum. Thank you so much, Amy. Today, Michelle Pontiff is our co-host. She's an education coordinator at Ogden Museum, and they are going to run um, the mechanism for us to, to have our conversation. I want to thank Bradley Sumrall, curator of the collection at Ogden Museum, for his work with both Renee Morales and with David Breslin to translate the selections um, in tandem and in consultation with both Renee and David into really stunning um, installations that I think really help underscore the intent of the juror as you uh, experience the work in, in, in the space and experience the relationships of these works to each other in the museum. Richard McCabe is our curator of photography and also the chief preparator and does a lot of the silent work uh, that you don't always see with the really stunning um, installations and the, the lighting in particular, along with Sam Scoggins, our uh, curator uh, for curatorial affairs. And Samantha is new to the, somewhat new to the department and has done just a tremendous job. And uh, Selena McCain, who is also in curatorial. I, I need to mention Melissa Kenyon also, who's director of marketing and museum experience because she's done a great job publicizing uh, Louisiana Contemporary. We had a lot of attendance for the exhibition when it opened in September and we have to date. So if you don't uh, know that it closes on Sunday, it closes tomorrow, and tomorrow there is a free admission day at Ogden Museum. If you're here in the city uh, or you can get here, uh, the museum will be open all day from 10 to 5 to free, again, courtesy Hellas Foundation, because we want people to see, see this exhibition. Okay, thank you very much. David and Renee, I'm so happy that you're joining us. 
I thought as the moderator, that's what I'm listed as here, um, as moderator, I wanted to, you know, maybe present some concepts in general and then let you sort of address in specificity. And then at any moment you can talk to the artists that are assembled, but we will transition over uh, and let them have the conversation for a little while. Uh, it was a very different year, Renee, that you had uh, from David, but I think in a way the sentiments of what you created and how you came to the process was very similar. So Renee, since you're the juror this year, maybe you would talk a little bit about the process this year and what type of engagement or the work that you saw. I know there's always some surprises when we have someone even deeply engaged in the art world from outside of the community in New Orleans and Louisiana, and they're seeing the work that is created in our place for the first time. And then David, I'll ask the exact same question of you. Thanks, Renee. Great. Sure, well, great. Well, first of all, thank you, William, and thank you, Amy. Thanks to everybody at the Ogden uh, for the invitation. And uh, it's been such a pleasure working with you all on this project, I have to say. Um, and, uh, you know, it, for this to happen in 2020 of all years, the most bizarre of years, uh, really made it special for me. Um, and, um, I, you know, I have to say the way that you all organize this uh, project every year, uh, the, the depth with which you uh, go through it all was really impressive to me. You know, I've, 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 like David, like I'm sure you as well, William, uh, most curators, we've done a thousand of these jury processes, but um, this one really emphasized a deep level of engagement. And, uh, you know, often we are asked to kind of helicopter in uh, whether, you know, physically or virtually uh, to uh, a particular artist community, whether it may be, uh, you know, give our two cents and pop back out. Uh, this process involved, you know, writing, it involved being part of the installation, um, it involved uh, giving a tour of this panel. Uh, so, I, and I just described that depth of engagement to the obvious passion that you all have for your artist community and, and the, um, the, the, the strong sense of responsibility, I think, that you all feel uh, being an institution in your community to support that, that, that artist uh, scene. And um, anyway, uh, yeah, it was um, just incredible, um, an incredible pleasure to get such a window into the artistic production of uh, your, your part of the world. And uh, particularly at this moment uh, where, uh, you know, obviously my, my main criterion for all decisions was, uh, had to do with aesthetics, the depth, depth of concept of the artwork. But in the process, I was also, um, you know, really uh, privileged, I think, to get such a great window into uh, the experience that you all have been going through uh, in uh, the context of this pandemic, in the context of um, the protest movements of the summer and uh, our general political insanity, uh, ongoing political insanity. Um, so um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's been a real pleasure and I only wish I could have uh, gone over there um, physically, uh, particularly to help with the installation, although I have to say, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm running on too much, um, there's such a difference when you're working with uh, exhibition designers, uh, prep folks who are really invested in the material, and when you're not. Uh, I think um, Brad, I really give a lot of credit to Bradley and Amy and that whole team. Uh, you made my work just incredibly easy. And I'm usually, you know, I'm usually the type of curator who will try every single combination and drive the, the prep crew completely crazy moving things around but i have to say um just uh, you all had a, such an intuitive grasp on um sort of where i was coming from with the selections and how to make them sense and make them make sense in physical space so uh, thank you thank you renee very much I, I appreciate all of the thought that you put into it in our correspondence over the time uh, since you were engaged to to be the juror of the exhibition and then all that transpired since. David, your experience was a little bit different, clearly, um, but I feel like there was a similar sentiment in, in getting that engaged rush of, of knowing this artwork. You wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, I think what's amazing is um, 
from the perspective of 2020 and now 2021, 2019 looks like a cakewalk, but 2019 was pretty bad too. <laughs> I think we have to realize that this has been a really tough period in, um, in American history, in, uh, in, in the international context. And so one of the reasons why I was so excited to see that Renee was curating this, um, this version of the show was he's a fundamentally like good person. And he's and he leads with people first, and I think that's what's in some ways interesting about the Ogden and the show is that it's really grounded in community, and it never forgets that people make artworks. They're not just some things that come out into the world and then end up on a wall. So I think that was what was uh, amazing in the in the process that um, I participated in. You end up sitting at home, not for me, not in New Orleans. I was in Brooklyn, New York looking at hundreds of artists submitting really great work and you realize there is no shortage of creative people. There is no shortage of incredibly fantastic artists. And to have a, a job, which is to kind of select and to uh, put that forward is uh, completely humbling, but also a lot of responsibilities to make, help to make sense of a moment and help to put some of those ideas forward. So um, yeah, I just wanna echo the thanks to William and Amy and Bradley for um, making our our work <laughs> look good, but also thanks obviously to all the artists and Window, Nick, uh, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Can't wait to see your work in person someday. And um, yeah, it's, that's I think that's what's so great um, about the experience. And also, I was lucky to go to, to the opening of the show and you know have drinks with William and 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 the artist, and also to be able to walk through that museum and see the collection, see the Benny Andrews. Uh, uh, installation and realize the context. This isn't a show that's in just a you know contemporary Kunsthalle. This is a show really embedded in the history of a collection and museum, which made it really an honor to work on as well. Thank you so much for saying that. We um, always have some creative technical difficulties, so if you see some uh, jockeying going on here between the participants in the chat, that's just me trying to rearrange um, rearrange these pictures. Okay, thank you. So um, if I go back to the jurors one more time, uh, a concept that had been on my mind um, that you may have spoken about a little bit, but we've always been interested in what our esteemed jurors see in our community as opposed to the communities that they're deeply within, ones that are at your, your right shoulder or elbow. Uh, and is, is there a difference? Is, it, is, is there any difference worth remarking on? Is it just a, a different colored coat or is it a different attitude you see percolating up through the artwork and materials or is it a style? Is there anything that you see defines a region differently, a place or even a concept? Well, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely resist the idea of a kind of style, a common style, a, a regional style, whether we're talking about uh, South Florida or Louisiana. Um, that said, of course, uh, just being artists living in a place, you draw from that place. And uh, some artists make that influence uh, more apparent than others. And um, you know, in some cases, it's quite subtle. Um, and, um, you know, of course, there's many artists who just want to make art uh, that, that uh, has its own kind of self-enclosed uh, meaning and, and value. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, that kind of balance uh, is uh, pretty uh, uh, probably, I, I hate to use the word universal, but it's definitely something I see here. Um, that said, you know, there's something about Louisiana, New Orleans, like this is such a unique context. I mean, you can say that about really every place is unique in its own way, obviously, uh, but uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. You don't need me to go into it. I mean, there really is a, 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 a such a distinct and complex and multi-layered um, uh, history and, and culture there um, that uh, it manifests itself uh, clearly to me was I was looking through those hundreds of submissions uh, just in that kind of effervescent creativity, the strong sense of uh, a lot of folks out there having a lot to say with their work. 
And um, I think that's, I see that here in this community here, which is very, in Miami, uh, which is very dear to me as well. Um, I think I, I might have uh, alluded briefly in my statement to the idea of some parallels or some similarities, some connections between Miami and New Orleans, which I, I think are interesting to think about without, you know, overblowing them too much. But um, certainly uh, there's a grim parallel, uh, which was that precisely at the moment when I was doing the, this jury, uh, we were trading back and forth the, 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 the distinction of being epicenters for this disease. So that we, we were really, really, um, I, I felt really kind of bonded and united. And I was, uh, when I was looking through these submissions, I was um, looking through them almost therapeutically, you know, to get a sense of connection with someone else, uh, another community out there that was in a similar situation as ours was with all the fear and all the, uh, the anxiety that that, that involved. Um, but at the same time, you know, there were many other connections. I noticed um, several works that uh, make references to Afro-Caribbean religions and, um, uh, you know, sort of syncretic cultures. Uh, New Orleans, in some ways, is a kind of, is a Caribbean city, the way that Miami is a Caribbean city. Um, and, and, and um, you know, I, I've always felt a kind of a brotherhood or, or a kinship uh, with that. And um, uh, certainly this sense of uh, being part of the same archipelago, if you, if you don't mind, if you will. Um, so yeah, it's been, um, a, it was really, really a pleasure to, to be able to get such an in-depth uh, experience uh, with, with, with the artistic production over there. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. Um, that makes a lot of sense what you say. Uh, we were always in this exhibition, I think, in looking for that balance and, and feeling very hopeful that our jurors are naturally feeling that way they are as well. Um, and your comments about the style, I really appreciate because what I think sometimes our artistic community and certainly Ogden Museum tries to, a myth we try and dispel among the many sort of swirling myths that surround New Orleans is that we have a you know, a particular flavor, that there is a t only one type of thing or that it's regional or that it may be even be a, a different type of provincial, like a, you know, a, a, um, a cultural community, but that is only what is, what is seen from this uh, popular culture lens. So you, you'll see a lot of the artists, I think in both the exhibitions and all of the Louisiana contemporaries, there's some incredible surprises. And they, they do bridge this concept of an artistic community that is truly international. And I think this year, having to do so much of what we did online and how people experience the exhibition a lot through social media and through the posts on Ogden Museum online really, really changed some of the way that, uh, and hopefully the breadth of what people saw. David, what do you think about that in terms of the artistic community, that unique context, the work that you experience where you are, um, did you find any connectivity? I mean, it's, there's only so many um, degrees of separation in the art world. And uh, we certainly have New Orleanians and Louis people from Louisiana working and living in the arts in New York and vice versa. But, um, and what discoveries were there? You know, I, I would completely agree with Renee about like this um, kind of myth of a, of a regional style. I mean, when I, I'm thinking to the the artists who won prizes last year. Um, Jessica Strahan won a prize. She works in figuration. Rachel David, who works in these incredible abstract welded works, won a prize. Sarah Danzinger is a great photographer um, of her community. Um, Thomas Deaton, these great paintings that are about landscape and place. In some ways, you could see work or artists who are thinking about similar things, but there is an intensity and kind of a commitment to place, maybe that um, it's not perhaps unique, but it is really distinctive. I think, and that, you know, I was able to feel that luckily because I was able to come and visit a few times and come back. The last time I was on a plane was actually in New Orleans to do um, some studio visits. So you realize that there is this, it doesn't mean that there's not criticism or critique of place, but there is kind of a thoughtfulness and wanting to really kind of think about what place means to these larger issues, how they ripple out. And for me, I think that was what was distinctive. Yeah, 
a great array of work in every medium that you could think of, from people of every background that you could think of, but really, really thinking about how that embeddedness in place can make any artistic practice kind of richer, because there's that context that's embedded within it. Thank you. Thank you, David. I appreciate especially your, um, the examples from last year. I remember those well, and it makes me think about and acknowledge how each of the artists, um, and we're about to, to speak to our artists who are gathered here today. I, know, I hope they have some thoughts about what we've been talking about so far. That concept, I think sometimes of a myth of a regional style is something that might be embedded into, into the ambition and drive to create work that has a, transcends that concept because it's often a force we sort of feel from the outside. You know, when people um, haven't gotten into the museum or gotten into the, the uh, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of art museums in New Orleans and there are a lot of galleries and there's a lot of artist studios and districts, but the, the, it takes an effort. It takes an effort to become more deeply engaged and aware and understanding of what these artists in our community are doing which was our big hope for uh, Louisiana Contemporary. And, and Renee, I wanted to comment on that concept that you had about this, this being a therapeutic or um, a opportunity to relieve the fear and anxiety. It certainly was bringing the artists together once again because it was a repetitive motion. And to be able to do that again this year, which was sort of that, the normal function in, in spite of everything. And even to have this gathering, I think, um, has, has really helped bring us and focus on the artists and the reason that we, we make this show and the museum exists. Artists, um, I think uh, if you, I'd like to just go through and we'll start um, with Anne Parrish. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Really appreciate that you're here and then the window into knit. Um, what do you think about what we're speaking so far, especially this concept of the community, the artist community, the artists that you may or may not be interacting with, but you're alongside in the exhibition at the moment? Well, first of all, I'm honored to be in the show. Just walking around and seeing all the great work this year is just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and I am fairly new to New Orleans, so I just got here like the end of 2019. So, I hadn't been here very long and the pandemic hit. And unfortunately, it was hard to meet people, you know, um, starting out. But being in the show, it's, um, it's just given me such a great honor. And I'm looking forward to meeting the artists once we're able to, to interact and mix, other than video. <laughs> But I was just struck with the community here in New Orleans. It's very welcoming. The artists are just tremendous. Uh, all kinds of, of influences and work and styles. And I just, you know, walking out your door, you can't help but just be inspired. Yeah. Thank you, and for that. Um, yeah. Window? If you would come in on that as well, we're interested to know um, in your experience with Louisiana Contemporary, and particularly this year. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I can um, kind of speak from myself, like I come from a uh, very, uh, coming from UNO, we thrived on being able to be around each other uh, art, like, and feed off of each other's ideas and stuff. And so that, that's been very hard. Uh, this year, not like having to keep such a tight circle and not being able to really engage with uh, with a whole lot of people that we kind of uh, made, you know, like like made our marks with. Uh, in um, speaking particularly in grad school, you know, I've kept those relationships with uh, with those artists, and it's been tough, like not being able to be around them and stuff. But um, I mean, like seeing the the exhibition, you know, it opens up new uh, new views, new opportunities, and hopefully we're able to kind of uh, kind of capitalize on those opportunities when we're able to be around each other again. Trying trying to um, keep that inspiration going and feed off of other people's enthusiasm and stuff. Um, the show has been such a I think a beautifully curated show. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, like people 
uh, who, who have participated in meeting those people or just being able to be around, you know, the, the, um, the artists that were included. I have a couple of, uh, a couple of friends that are in the show that I, that I see on kind of a regular, uh, regular basis, maybe not, not so often now, but, um, yeah, like being in New Orleans, we're always kind of creating and always finding new avenues to uh, to go down, and that that those relationships with artists um, that's a key point I think in our in our process, at least like definitely in my uh, in my process. Yeah. Thank you, Wenda, very much. And uh, when Windows back on, you'll notice there are two paintings behind him. I should have pointed out one is windows you'll see I think on uh, on the left and then the one on the right is Angel Perdomo who was a Louisiana contemporary uh, he was in a prior exhibition I think um, was the best in show uh, or first place and I saw a piece behind Anne I didn't comment on it if it was hers or not but Nick not <laughs> um, I thought I might ask yes no it's Nick, a I thought I might ask okay excellent uh, well always notice the art behind people in their settings. Um, and we have uh, the, 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 the artists joining us today working in photography, painting, and video. I found that work, you know, is it, at the same time simultaneously very personal and also temporal uh, with um, engaging the artistic community as I think is done year after year. The artists reflect the world that we live in. And this year it seems a little bit uh, even more intensified Nick, welcome. What do you think about um, these concepts we're we're talking about? Art, community, myth. Yeah, um, I mean, it makes me think a lot about um, the city of New Orleans. Um, you know, being somebody, being an artist who's born and raised here, and just you know, getting to absorb the the endless layers of culture throughout my life. Um, I particularly think about you know what Renee was speaking about earlier, just the city being an extension of the Caribbean. Um, you know, I've, I've seen that throughout my entire life, you know, I've seen it even different ways. I'm the son of a Haitian woman and, and just experienced the Haitian culture throughout my life. Um, and then seeing the ways that that culture translates to, to New Orleans. Um, I think even like one said, you know, the city is just so creative. Like, I think even if you don't consider yourself an artist here, um, the, like, you, you have some type of artistry in you, whether it comes up during Mardi Gras or um, whether it comes out when you go to a second line, like there's, there's just all these endless layers of, of culture and creativity constantly um, in your experience as, as a resident here. So I think that makes me think about that. And also um, in terms of just the, the show and, and the exhibition, um, you know, for me, the piece that, that's in this show actually created um, right at the beginning of quarantine. And so for me, um, the inclusion in this exhibition, I think Renee was also the one who mentioned just the idea of this being therapeutic. And so like for me, I think at the beginning of quarantine was, was a period where I did get to um, focus on creating works and really using that um, art as therapy in that way. And so, um, yeah, I think that's, that's what it makes me think about. And just also, I just want to express my gratitude and honor to be, be in the exhibition. So thank you all um, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Nick, uh, and our artists. We will uh, talk to the, our jurors again, um, and then and then go back to the artists. And I want to give you the opportunity, not just to respond to something I ask. I think in a um, we were all sitting in the same room or on the same stage. We would have the the I think interactivity would be a little bit more easier. Right now, we're either playing Hollywood Squares or you're a linear. Uh, series of boxes across the top. So uh, I don't want it to be just a one-way conversation. And um, as my team knows, if you put me in charge of the lecture, it will last only two hours. So I want to offer to both Renee and David the opportunity to pose questions to the artists um, that are here. And, and we'll do that in just a minute. Um, when I, after I reach back to our jurors, you know, the, you've, we kind of took one concept full circle, which was this, or a couple really, about the, 
the um, place that New Orleans exists in and how it is one place and singular. And, and when Louisiana Contemporary clearly represents a lot of communities within Louisiana, and certainly those communities are represented in the city. So uh, perhaps as a misnomer, I, I use them interchangeably um, when I'm referring to this exhibition. One thing that's amazing about Louisiana Contemporary and I think one of the most important things that we promote um, with our friends at Hellas Foundation who, rep who present this every year is the connectivity, the dotted lines, the sort of um, ability for the art that we do to show up and sort of sprout simultaneously, whether you're looking at it or not, and the ability to bring it together at one time for a really close examination. And, and that examination is for the museum, for the foundation, for our staff, our board of trustees, visitors and volunteers, to be able to recognize the, the artist community and to put that group in, in the most prominent you know, place that we can with the most intense focus that we can and examine everything that we've talked about, whether it is this concept of regionalism, but also this internationalism, how we are one place, but also so many places. Um, and we have more frequently now, now than ever talked about, um, you know, one of the casual phrases is that New Orleans is the uh, westernmost Caribbean city. Um, and w certainly our climate and so many things about what we do would really speak to that. But if you look into the art that we're doing and not just the custom and culture that people see in our community every day and across Louisiana, but um, we, we're really understanding more about the, those deep roots and that deep engagement. And it makes me think about um, the pieces that our artists are making. Um, all three of the artists today are really speaking about how those things are coming together in our community. The uh, art itself is a, a very reflective lens. So, um, Renee. Uh, after we've had this conversation and we've talked about this um, culture that we put together here and how it reacts either to your community or to this community, are there other um, relationships that you see from the art that you've experienced so far or maybe a, an interest in that? And what I specifically mean is just artists that live and work in Miami or the artists that live and work in New York? Is there any mapping that comes to your mind in between this art? Uh, you mean as far as uh, interconnections between uh, my context and New Orleans? Uh, uh, well, yeah, like I mentioned, um, these are uh, I, these are both complex cities. They're multi-layered cities. They're, they're places that uh, have uh, that are innervated by these syncretic cultures and uh, syncretism is you know uh, sort of inherently creative right that's just a there's like an energy like a hum that happens uh, when when you have syncretic cultures you know many cultures coming together or not coming together or just uh, you know abiding uh, alongside each other that kind of tension that energy um, and um, I, I, I felt that come across uh, I think in a lot of the work that that um, that I saw, um, and um, you know, something I wanted to uh, go back to a bit is uh, that word therapeutic, because you know, when I used that word just now, I was really thinking about how this experience was therapeutic for me. But uh, the way that Nick kind of um, shifted that a bit was really eye-opening for me, and kind of it's very touching to me. And I think that this this experience, the, the Louisiana Contemporary, uh, I really hope that it, um, you know, that, that it had the therapeutic effect for, for this art community, uh, that just, just by virtue of bringing together a community that uh, had been forced apart for months and months. Um, I find that really touching. And, um, and that makes me think of Anne in particular and your experience. I've known a few people who uh, moved to Miami just weeks or uh, days even um, before the pandemic hit and I just can't imagine how, how difficult that must be and how um, kind of um, discombobulating and disorienting that must be to be in a new place. I mean as it is it take it always takes about a year, year and a half before you really get a sense of a place before you really feel at home. Um, so uh, you know you mentioning that really kind of made me see the work that you submitted in a different way. Uh, 
Um, I, I, I always did get a sense from those photographs that those photographs were underscored by a kind of a yearning to connect uh, with, with these people, these strangers, right? I assume they were strangers in most cases. Right. Um, but but given, given this background, what you're talking about, of having just sort of plopped into New Orleans and being, and being like, where, where is everybody, you know? Um, uh, at that, I can see how um, the, the stakes for that, that process of interconnection uh, must have been so high for you as, as you've worked out this series. Right, it was coming in as an outsider. Um, I kind of hit the ground running with Mardi Gras. Everybody was having fun, Every, everything was normal. This, oh yeah, this is New Orleans, okay. Oh. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's the opposite. And so I was just, that's, that was my way of connecting with people, was going out and documenting what was happening in the world at the moment. And, you know, I would ask people if they, would mind if I took their picture? We'd have a conversation, and most said yes. They didn't mind, um, um, and it really it was. It was a very isolating time. But I think, like you've been saying, with the therapeutic aspect of art, that was my way of dealing with everything that was going on. You know, the pandemic, the the rallies, the the you know the uh, election, everything. But it was very isolating feeling, and at times I felt so alone. <laughs> but, you know, we all made it through, and we found ways to work through it. Yeah, and I noticed the titles of the works in this series, uh, it, 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 are, are, I think all of them uh, consist of two words, right? Um, two adjectives uh, that might actually be, um, uh, you know, similar or completely opposite. Uh, and it refers to how, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it refers to how when we're wearing masks, uh, there's always this kind of ambiguity where you can't, when you can't read all the cues that you normally would, there's just, uh, uh, it, it makes it that much, diff that much harder for you to tell where this person is coming from, what they're feeling at that moment. Uh, exactly. So, Not only yeah. are they a stranger, but they're a stranger that you can't read. Are they a yeah. friendly stranger or a strange stranger? Yeah. But, um, and that serves as such an allegory for just the situation that we're all in right now and being exactly. uh, uh, apart from each other. Um, I mean, what I read into that series was a strong sense of anxiety about that inability to really know for sure uh, what the other is experiencing and feeling. And, right. I think um, that's, that's what everybody really experiences. Concerning everybody was experiencing and still experiencing when you're conversing with people wearing masks and it yeah. just brought that to light maybe it's not on a conscious level but i think we all have that we all have that inside us not knowing exactly what's happening it causes a, that underlying anxiety yeah and, and then you throw in uh, the fact that this is just such a divisive time where uh, you know, the, the person you run into could be on the totally other end of the spectrum in terms of their worldview and their sense of reality. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, in that sense, the series really, I think, had a powerful way of summing up uh, the, the, the moment. Thanks, yeah, I hope so. Thank you. Um, thank you both. I want to turn attention to the chat. I know, David, I said we, you were going to comment on this as well, but this is, this is directly related to the conversation that Anne and Renee were having. And this is a, um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Michael Ebel, who's reminding us or reminding me that it's Louisiana contemporary and that, you know, we're representing artists from across the entire state. So if I wasn't very specific about that, apologies. It, it does represent a, a large and diverse community within our state. So let's see, uh, Nyomi Sechuler uh, or Sechuler, had a first she wanted to recognize and appreciate Nick Aziz and Window Brunoir for the work that directly addresses skillfully she points out um, cultural appropriation from a place of cultural authority as artists so she had a three-part question I would like to bullet the points and then um, ask both Nick uh, Nick Window and Anne to comment on these pieces so overall speaking to works that you have in the exhibit um, regarding cultural appropriation, um, what do you think about, um, or the jurors it would be, what do you think about BIPOC culture being appropriated 
by white artists. You know, we've had pieces in the past that were specifically created by white artists that addressed this concept of cultural appropriation, but, but you wouldn't know that because if you didn't know that the artist was white or a person of color, and if you're embedded in the art community, you would know that. And it's very interesting when you jury a piece only seeing the artwork and you may not know the artist's cultural identity or their race or what community they represent. And that can sometimes, it, as Renee said, it, it creates these sort of, you know, these lines of demarcation that we, we cross within the exhibition back and forth. So what is your feeling about the impact, one? Um, and then, and specifically, uh, the question was, what, what do you feel the photographer's responsibility is to the subject? And do we, to what extent do you feel like you have to have their express consent? And your process of, um, I think, consent and reciprocity, and what I think that means is acknowledgement of the subject in the work. And then the final portion was, what is the importance of having conversations that facilitate accountability and ethics? I think the exhibition may be the starting point for that. I think that's why this work in many ways is chosen and it's on the wall and it, it confronts some of the questions, if not just allows them to be asked. Uh, and I feel that's what the jurors do. So I'll ask the artists to speak about this range of concepts uh, and then the jurors. Um, let's begin with Nick. Um, yeah, um, obviously makes me think about a lot. Thank you. Um, for that question. Um, I think for me, when thinking about my piece specifically, it kind of makes me think about uh, something that David mentioned earlier in terms of um, objects versus people. And so I, I think if we're looking at the contemporary art industry as it's constructed right now, you know, it has been built to give more value to a object than a person, you know, and thinking about, um, that object versus the maker. And so in, in relationship to my piece, I think about um, just my fascination with the, um, the dissonance that comes with imperialism. And so like the idea that, you know, 90% of, it's estimated by experts that 90% of African art exists outside the continent of Africa. And so if that's the, and then it's also, you know, said that, you know, numerous of the first museums were built to house these looted African objects. And so, my piece is really just interrogating that, but thinking about it from the idea of, of value, you know, and looking at how um, at this point, you know, an artist can make a piece of work, particularly as a black artist, that's, that's given more quote unquote value than their actual personhood. And so I think to me, that dissonance starts with the foundation of extract, illegally taking objects and then bringing them to these, you know, undisclosed exclusionary locations to where you can then, you know, um, choose who has access to it and then choose how it's also contextualized and choose what is quote unquote art versus what is not. And, um, you know, to me, that's just something I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated with. And, and, and two, I think thinking about like a city like New Orleans, how we've all kind of said, you know, is the most Caribbean city. You know, I, I would also believe, you know, it's, it's the most African city in the United States. Um, it's also the most European city in the United States. But you know, I think we can all also agree that its Africanness is not illuminated as, as much as its Europeanness. And so um, I think it just all kind of goes back to that idea of value and like how we have been um, conditioned to place value on certain things and, and, and that relationship to the imperial condition, in my opinion. Thank you, Nick, for that. Um, Wendo, would you take a moment to comment on, on what we're talking about so far? Uh, yes, good uh, question. Like in relation to um, to my piece, the um, the appropriation uh, of a masterpiece. Um, of course, it's a it's a Picasso um, kind of kind of uh, kind of theme piece. But I I remember um, in grad school I was um, taught by a gentleman Nick Stillman who actually. Um, brought to my attention the Limousel de Avion. And um, when I looked at it, I just saw a painting, but then when he broke down about the African, uh, the African mask that the two women are wearing, it kind of dawned, uh, dawned on me that um, these are actually, you know, like, like Picasso is actually taking from 
the, um, the simplistic forms of African, uh, African mask making. And I, you know, began kind of doing, doing research on Picasso and um, I never, never like really saw anything where that was addressed of him deriving his whole style from the simplistic forms of African, uh, African mask making. So when I approached my piece, um, essentially like trying to not really criticize Picasso, but just to do the same thing that, um, do the same thing that he essentially did for, um, for his art was that it derived from uh, a cultural appropriation. So being that the, uh, the Limousel de Avion is this, uh, this world-renowned art piece, I wanted to kind of tackle that juggernaut and actually take the, actually draw attention to that. Um, it actually came from a cultural appropriation. So I wanted to, in a sense, take it, uh, take it back in a, in a sense of my own, like of my own creation. And I think it goes, uh, it goes great with, uh, with Nick's piece on the, um, on the African art being commodified and actually taken from the, the place of its origin. And so I think um, maybe more and more will get a little more comfortable in talking about that, not necessarily um, placing blame or fault, but just giving credit where credit's due. I think that is the, uh, the, the actual next level that we you know, discuss, like just talking about where these origins come from and not being afraid of the history in which they, they, uh, they came from and just being open enough to discuss those, uh, those methods of inspiration that obviously like caught the attention of these, um, these art makers and these art collectors. So I think that's more of where I would like to see the conversation uh, here too. Thank you so much, Window. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change a little bit from what I said I was going to do. I was watching David um, Breslin and, and reading some of his body language, and I know that he's got experience with the painting that Window was just talking about being right there, um, literally at, the, at, at his elbow many times, and in New York. And David, what do you think about that concept? I'm not, I'm not sure it's one, I'm sure it came to you in Louisiana Contemporary in 2019. I mean, this is something that we think a lot about in Louisiana because of this, you know, this blend of acknowledgement where all of the influences come from. But now this is also a thing that is very important, certainly since 2019 to now, if you take the period of time from when you were the juror and now Renee, this is a topic that's, it's a headline as a matter of fact. So um, how do you respond or what are your thoughts about it? I mean, it's hard to follow up Wendo and, and Nick on it because I think they put it so well. I mean, one of the things that I think about a lot is how impossible it is to separate identity from art making. It makes for bad art history, it makes for bad art, and it makes for bad politics. <laughs> you know, like it, in no way is it a good thing. And for me, for anyone who wants to say, well, can't we just look at this work as if it's frozen in time or out of context? I'm like, well, can you do the same thing for yourself? Like, how's your back feeling? You know, like, how's your mom? <laughs> what book are you reading? You know, like, it's impossible to have that exchange without really, in some ways, thinking about who the maker is of that work and why she, he, or they is arriving at it. I think Nick's point, um, talking about how objects are extracted and the makers are completely, um, you know, not thought about. It's an abomination how frequently those, those objects are not even thought of having, as having makers, but just coming from a place. You know, so in some ways, not even endowing the, the subjecthood of the, of the maker is one of like the, I think the really false moves that, that can happen when we try to take the artwork in a context that doesn't acknowledge the artist who's always, always behind it. There's this really amazing book that I just read, so it's top of my mind called um, The Metabolic Museum um, by Clementine Delise. And she was talking about how do we bring artists who know how to engage with objects to look at 
objects that have frequently just been called ethnographic objects. They're not ethn ethnographic objects, they're artworks. Um, and really kind of this endowing of, of subjecthood back to the maker so that to Wendo's point, that maker who made the mask in the Picasso painting can be seen for the work that that person did equally to Picasso's work. So how do we create those contexts to, I think Wendo put it exactly right, we're talking about them. It's not in the background. It's not just in the label, you know, like that we enter into this in, in really conscientiously. So when someone does want to disregard it, we know what they're disregarding <laughs> as much as we know what they're uh, regarding when they're, when they're looking at that work or talking about it. Thank you so much, David. Um, I want to get back to the question that was posed to Anne and then, and then ask Renee to chime in and then we'll look at the chat for a little bit. Um, and we still have all of our followers with her. So thank you with us. Thank you for those of joining us. I should have also mentioned Yomi is in the exhibition. The, the person who posed the, the artist who posed that question is in Louisiana contemporary. So, Anne, we're going to turn the question back to you. And it had, um, as, as a very specific part of that question was the idea of, um, consent and reciprocity or how the artist approaches the subject as maybe representing of cultural influence or um, a part, part owner of the image that is made or the work that is created. That's and a, I know you touched yeah. on it earlier. Well, that's a really great question. And it's, and believe it or not, I always struggle with that when I'm out shooting. Um, you know, am I being selfish to take a picture of a person if they don't know it? Um, should I approach them? You know, and a lot of it depends on on the shot. Usually I approach the subject and I, and I ask, is it okay if I take your picture? Um, because that way you get a better picture usually, <laughs> unless you're trying to sneak up on them. But, you know, what's gonna be the use? Am I going to display it? Am I going to sell it? Is it for my own personal, um, you know, portfolio to enjoy? I think it's it's something that, and in this day and age with everybody taking photos when they're outside, it's, I, you know, I really don't even know the legal ramifications. Um, I feel personally, if I have an oral okay, if they say, yeah, go ahead, take my picture, then I feel that it's a mutual project. They have allowed me to use their image and I've taken their image and I can do with it what I want. Um, but I think if you'd ask five, 10 different photographers, you would get five, 10 different answers on that question. It's, it's a really tough one. It is, uh, it is a tough question. It's one I think that bears asking over and over and, and we maybe have different answers at different times for it. Renee, I was going to turn to you now, um, uh, to comment on the, the cycle of, of comments we're making. Sure. Well, um, let me reach back a little bit and talk about appropriation because you're right, that's a really interesting uh, kind of bond between Wendell's work and uh, Nick's work. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, focusing in on Nick in particular, uh, you know, I was really struck with this piece that in one sense is such a lucid kind of um, encapsulation of so many of the arguments, the theoretical arguments about um, uh, cultural imperialistic appropriation. Uh, I mean, there aren't that many, there are only a few sentences uttered in this, um, throughout this video, but if you were to sort of put them together in a list and then unpack them, you have a whole course on post-colonial theory there. Um, uh, but at the same time, through the soundtrack, uh, which I believe is notorious B.I.G., right? Um, it's Biggie. Uh, it adds, uh, you know, first of all, a, a kind of a, a very, there, there's an intensity to the dissonance, right, between these uh, white people very calmly talking about the problematics of this subject uh, in, in this very cool, uh, detached way, right? It adds a, a strong sense of emotion and a sense of urgency and a sense of why this is important. And of course, it adds a sense of contemporaneity, like the sense that this is something that is uh, not just, um, you know, some some uh, academic argument, uh, but something that's just very real uh, for the moment. And 
um, with Wendo, your treatment of the uh, demoiselle uh, face, uh, what you did was you painted it all black. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, pull out an interpretation there uh, when, when I have you right there, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, about the removal of, of color. Uh, in combination with this idea of appropriation and and critique of um, I mean appropriation is a really bland word for uh, the the kind of the violence that Picasso uh, and uh, Picasso's culture did to the source material. Right? Well, um, in in regards to it, I wanted to um, I wanted to devoid it of color. Uh, to not reference um, the, I want to say the um, the painting style of Picasso. I was always a fan, um, always been a fan of uh, of Picasso. I've always been inspired by his work, his use of color, his use of like uh, brush strokes, and um, the the ways that he composed his uh, composed his paintings. But with this piece, I didn't want to necessarily make. Uh, make a piece just like Picasso. I wanted to, and, and I, so I figured, um, how could I, like, how could I do that? And I remember reading uh, a, um, it was something that uh, Clement Greenberg was talking about in, uh, in his essay on collage, and he was saying how uh, Picasso essentially failed that collage, and because he failed to break the surface plane, and so when I, uh, when I approached this painting, it started out as just a sketch and I thought, well, what can I do that would be different? And I said, well, okay, I had these, um, I had this machinery at my disposal. So I was like, okay, well, I'll do what, um, what Clement Greenberg uh, said that Picasso didn't do. I'll break the surface plane. And in doing that, I thought about the, uh, the ways that, that, masks, uh, that African masks were actually carved and they were carved out of these, you know, like single, uh, like single pieces of uh, of wood. And so the the actual like layers were the um, were the reliefs of the um, of the the wood itself. And so I wanted to mimic that and bring it back to the essential um, kind of the essential material that the mask itself was made from. Um, I know I didn't do that with, you know, uh, with relieving out of one piece of wood. I took uh, took several pieces of wood and just like layered them on top of each other to create that effect of uh, of of the of the carving. But then um, I thought about coloring it, but I wanted to give it a just a monotone, like you know, just just a monotone um, style. So I left it. Well, I spray painted it all um, this really dark, uh, this really dark brown, and I thought about adding colors onto it. But then I thought, no, I'm staying. I'm not. I'm not going to stay true to it anymore. Um, my concept of bringing back to the uh, to the African uh, art art mass making, um, and so I wanted to just leave it at that, just devoided of color, devoided of uh, like voided of any kind of um, modern like like modern sense of the art and just keep it in the actual realm that it was made at uh like at you know in in its original original form and so that's why i didn't want to have any um any kind of any kind of color any kind of suggestion of um of paint you know, in, in the artistic matter, but just see it for a, an almost like sculptural, um, an almost sculptural sense of, uh, of context, you know, but, and, but at the end of the day, I, I am still a painter. So that's why I wanted it on the wall, wanted it to kind of just hang and, but I didn't want to apply those methods of, uh, of painting that I normally am trained, uh, trained with. I'm not sure that 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 answers answers yeah uh, yeah no it's really interesting it's uh yeah yeah almost like a reversal of that the 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 appropriate uh, Picasso's appropriation exactly you know, bringing it back yeah yeah uh, an undoing of that and Nick mm -hmm. what did, what did you think of this idea like your piece I think is so much about disrupting that narrative of appropriate of appropriation that sort of traditional imperial imperial uh, process is that is that how you see the work. 
Do that. We might have lost Nick as well. Audio issues. Um, um, I think. Can you hear me? You're breaking up a bit. Nick, I, I know Nick had some technical difficulty earlier. I think he's going to leave and then rejoin and see if that improves. I, I've been having some audio issues. Was trying to. Yeah, excellent. Nick, you can try again. I know with the video feed cut off, sometimes it clears uh, up the channel a little bit. Okay, we're going to keep that question warm for you, Nick. Uh, you, I don't know if you want to try again to leave the the uh, conversation and come back in if that establishes a better connection, but we'll we will keep that warm for you. Um, I had a couple of comments that I wanted to go through in the chat because we still have we have more people uh, than ever joining us and really appreciative of that makes it feel kind of like um, it would in any year. Uh, James Flynn has made a few comments. His primary question was really to, I think, about Windows work and maybe a comment of frustration that it, that Windows work in particular by name and then other artists who are addressing the cultural appropriation concept in, in a time of where it's most timely, how, how they're not getting more attention from uh, or focus on that within our art community, the art world, the maybe even the national media. Um, and then followed up by a question from Happy Lance Brunius um, that says, and this is bringing us back to the formality in art and how you create it and why you create it. Although politics may play a part of your inspiration, what inspires the quality of the color um, and, and the emotional attachments created in your artistic expression? So that's kind of a big question, actually. So Nick is back with us. We'll try and refocus back on on the comments that Nick was making and, and hope his audio stays with us. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think just uh, really quick, I don't want to take away from the other question, but um, you know, for me, the piece, um, you know, really I wanted to, one of the intents was to show how this um, Imperial Foundation relates to the appreciation of art from black artists today. And so um, thinking about, you know, contemporary art and black art is one example, but I mean, this this type of appropriation and, and devaluation can be seen with um, jazz music, you know, um, blues, um, even hip hop, you know, to an extent, you know, I think just just the, the idea of black art itself, you know, being something that is constantly um, appropriated and, and then that against the, the abstraction of just black life and the black experience. And the fact, again, like I said, you know, that as black artists, you know, that this work can get so much more value than our personhood. And so um, that's kind of how you see like in, in you know, in, on one end, you know, using Biggie, you know, and that song as, as a way to kind of um, juxtapose this kind of more academic discussion with, with hip hop, um, you know, relating to the end of the piece where, you know, I, I you know, reference um, Kerry James Marshall and Basquiat and this idea that, you know, um, Kerry James Marshall's piece can sell at auction for $21 million, you know, and, and Basquiat's piece can sell at auction for $150 million. And yet these artists at this point, the way the industry is constructed are still not getting, you know, any proceeds from that. And so I think that's just a little wild. I think that's, um, you know, I think that's pimping. Like, like the title says, you know, it's pimping ain't easy. And, and it's like this idea that, you know, that has been going on, whether we're talking about looting African objects from the continent, or we're talking about contemporary Basquiat. And I think just having that conversation. And so like, the piece, you know, is, is a trilogy of video works that I've made kind of around these topics. And so like the, the ending with Basquiat and Carrie James Marshall is, is an attempt to kind of lead you into the second piece of the trilogy. Um, and just thinking about, you know, these things and, and just the, the idea of value and black art and, and appropriation itself. Thank you, Nick. I'm glad, I'm glad you, um, that we could reach back to that question. I, I want to, put David Breslin on the spot because that's a perfect kind of segue to the conversation we had about a year ago almost, David, in March with your upcoming, you'll be curating the 2021 Whitney Biennial. And in the artists that you're 
you know, surveying right now or speaking to or visiting with, is this something that you're seeing um, more of or less of, or is it in the, the context of what you're considering for the next installation of the biennial, or is it still developing in, in the way that you're interacting with those? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a great and it's a big question and it's, yeah, something that we're hearing a lot. And um, the biennial has been pushed to 2022 and I'm working on it with my great colleague, Adrian Edwards. And I think what's, um, you know, working on this show in this context is we're also looking at what is the place of museums in our culture right now? Who do they serve? What do they do? What are the priorities? Uh, you know, Nick talks about, you know, value, and that's such an important thing to be talking about. And, you know, what is, you know, wh what are you surfing? Who are you surfing, more importantly? And I think what's interesting is how do we distinguish something like the value of a work and the values that we as curators, artists, institutions are bringing so that we kind of can provide a context where an artist is proud to see their work, you know? And I think that's one of the things that's, you know, weighs deeply on us when we're thinking about this show is that every show that goes up isn't done in a vacuum. Like you're creating uh, a situation for that show to happen in. And, um, you know, I always think about this, this term radical hospitality, you know, it is our job to create a welcoming, whether it's for people who see the show or the artists who are making the work that allow the show to happen. So, um, yeah, this kind of question of how value relates to values, how we kind of lead with our values and what we do is something that we think about all the time. And in some ways, how does that prepare for us to have an open uh, and honest conversation with an artist so that uh, that work um, is placed within a context where, uh, you know, he or she feels like it belongs. It's not obvious that, a, that an artist would want to, you know, like it's an honor to be in a show. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, really a time that we're questioning what the shows do, who they serve at the end of the day. So um, I think these are all important questions that, yeah, we're having every day. Thank you, David. I wanted to turn back to the last question that I got in the chat. Um, I'll modify it a little bit though, based on what David just said, and I'm gonna ask each of our um, artists, starting with Anne and then Window and Nick, um, and then we'll finish up with final comments from uh, Renee and David and with great appreciation. So this question that, that I wanna rephrase is now, we are always and still talking about art, and art has that great array of formal uh, qualities about it and it's those those are the qualities that we um, we rely on or artists rely on for it to carry the variety of messages that we've been talking about today so with with what David was just saying about um, the art that he's viewing as they work towards the 2022 biennial and and what Renee has mentioned with the um, the cultural community and the origins of the roots are we moving the artwork our artists that i'm going to ask here with us are you bringing that first into the studio or is it still are you still really heavily reliant on your interest in the formal qualities of art the, what, the color form shape and all the theories that are attendant to that and you're a photographer um but still how is this uh, Um, I didn't hear the last sentence you said, but um, let me reply to what I did hear. Um, I think it's an emotional thing for me. When I go out, if I am struck by something visually, it has resonated with me emotionally, and I need to capture that. And my hope is that when other people see it, they will be affected likewise. Um, I'm trying to think what else did you ask? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I, I think you answered it fine. I mean, it's the, when I'm, these questions I hope are kind of springboards into what you do artists and that, I mean, that's a perfect answer. That's what exactly. is driving you to go see w what it is that becomes the work that you make. That's yeah, more intuitive. It's not um, a formal thing. It's, 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 a, it's, it's intuitive. <laughs> 
window. Do you do you feel the same way about the work that you do in this? Well, I think that um, I mean, as a as a painter, I'm always thinking about color, form, and um, and values like that. But I mean, within the last uh, within the last couple of years, you know, political, politically, culturally, um, especially being a being a black man and um, you know, born and raised in, in New Orleans, we have started to like really kind of kind of question, you know, what is our like what is our worth? What is our relevance here? You know, and so those questions um, brought on, you know, on on the local on the local scale as well as the the uh, the the world scale. Like, what is our um, what is our relevance here in politically, um, religious, cult, like cultural? All these all these things uh, are being put into our daily conversations now they're not just um they're not just 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 talk that we that we do amongst you know other um other people that are like-minded it's now um i know with me i talk about these issues with any and everybody um i talk about it with my sister who i've never talked about it with, uh, with before you know i've talked about it with my mother with my cousins with uh with with some other uh, other artists whose uh, whose opinions I, I I value, and so I think um, as far as pushing the um, pushing the conversation forward, that's a uh, that's what's going to become the new I think become the new challenge. It's not necessarily just about form and uh, form and color, uh, any not not so much uh, about form and color, but about relevance. Like, what are we saying? in the midst of all of us being affected like in this pandemic um what are what is our common ground what's our our commonality and how do we close that that spectrum from you being over here me being over here what is the the, the in between uh with us i think that's what's gonna kind of push that com push our conversations more and get us more comfortable in talking about our um our differences as well as similarities those uh i think those forms and uh those forms and functions are what's going to be more like become more prevalent in our uh in our conversations about art as well as how does the um you know like what part do the galleries museums play in helping us get that conversation started um i think that would be where our um sort of sort of come like where our conversations will start to go from here or at least that's what i would love to love to see like what part do we all play in this because we've already seen within this pandemic how small we can feel but also how, how big we uh how, how important we are you know and so that that sort of um that sort of mindset is what i'm hoping that we all get to step forward you know into Thank you, Window. Nick, do you have something to add that you will? Yeah, I mean, I I just um, echo Ann and, and Window and um, and saying, you know, from my perspective, you know, when I bring you know my work and ideas into the studio, um, it's it's always come from a place of that hasn't been formal. Um, you know, I, I I didn't have any formal training as an artist, um, but I say, you know, New Orleans was my art teacher. Um, New Orleans, I think, is like I've said, you know, is, is one of the most cultural cities in the world. And so, you know, being able to grow up here, I'm mean, experience that culture, I think has influenced my practice in an in endless number of ways. Um, being, you know, a Haitian, you know, American Haitian, you know, um, growing up in a Haitian family, my aunt, my, my mom, my dad, you know, growing up in a family of artists and entrepreneurs has all, I think, influenced my practice um, to the point where it's always been um, rooted in people and community and, and social practice, I think. And so, I think, you know, even as as museums, you know, and institutions and galleries start to question this, um, I think, you know, it's really, and it's particularly in a city like New Orleans, getting back to that root of the social practice. Like, like the art in New Orleans is, is, in, is in the streets. You know, the art is in the people. You know, the art is in the, the Mardi Gras Indians, the, um, the food, you know, the, the, the music, you know, all these things that happen in the street. Um, and so I think, like, kind of finding that that in between now is kind of where we're headed back to of, of really showing that the art is with the people, not this, you know, exclusionary building, you know, that that some of which have been rooted in imperialism. You know, it's like kind of finding that balance, I think, is is the is the way forward. 
Yeah, thank you for that very much. Um, I'm just realizing too that for our artists here, uh, this may be the first time that you're getting to see Renee. Um, you may have had the chance to interact with David when he came last year. So um, I'll give you a moment as we sort of cycle out to, to uh, maybe it's a little later in the game to pose a question, but to at least um, have the interaction. Uh, David, is there anything that's, that's burning in your mind right now about the conversations we've been having or Louisiana Contemporary 2020 or 2019 or any of those experiences? I mean, I just think that, um, you know, in the middle of a pandemic for all of the artists to be making work for the show to come up, for the audience to support it, for us to be here shows that we really care about art. We think it's important. We think it's essential. Doesn't mean we're not going to criticize it ourselves, our institutions and what we do. But I think it, it, it does mean that it has value. And how do we expand on those those questions and make them more, you know, pertinent to our everyday lives for me is what's great about, you know, being with you today and, and having this conversation. Uh, when I worked on the show, there was this poem that was like really pulsing through my head by Terrence Hayes and he has this great line in it where he says, I mean to leave a record of my raptures. And what I love about that is, you know, even in tough times, especially tough times, we want to leave a record of, of what we do. And art is a way to do that and really to kind of embed in that time, not just what is uh, in, kind of inscribing in that time where the individual is, where the eye is. And, uh, you know, I think a conversation like this really shows that it's about that kind of constellations of eyes coming forward to create the, the world we want to be in. Thank you. Thank you, David. I like that concept, the constellation of eyes. Renee, um, I ask the same thing of you. Is there something burning right now that you uh, either want to pose, ask, or comment on as we sort of come to the end of a conversation? Uh, no, I, I, um, I don't have a lot to add other than, I mean, I, what David just said, I think was just very uh, beautifully phrased and really sums up uh, what so many of us do all of this for uh, um, art serves uh, as a record of our raptures. And um, I would just add, uh, it also uh, serves as a, a kind of a, a gathering point, a lightning rod for the kind of questioning that we were just talking about. Uh, and um, that kind of questioning is always important, but it's particularly important at this moment uh, when where it's such a pivotal phase in our in our cultural history, and I uh, again commend uh, all the artists in the show and uh, the Ogden for creating this opportunity to come together and bring that out, bring that that part of our art out, uh, the, the way it serves as a um, as as um, again like a lightning rod for these questions. Um, it's it's never been more important. Thank you, Renee. Uh, so to each of our artists, and a last thought for our assembled group. I would just say that I think art is a language that everybody understands and can comprehend. And I love, I love that it just trans, it just, um, there are no boundaries with art. I think it, it you can just, we just need to be open to it. Everybody is um, speaking the same language. Thank you, and very much, and for being here today. Window, any parting? Um, I just hope I, I, I love uh, being a part of the show. I am very, uh, very proud to be a participant in it. I hope that this uh that starts you know like a real conversation about kind of about like what uh what direction we go from here i mean i think um i think all of us as americans we're you know um we're kind of having that question in our um in our head like where do we go from here once you know once we have the the uh the pandemic under under control like the new the new government administration but I'll, but I want to kind of uh, you know say like 
where do we go from here with our uh, with our cultural practices? Do we start to repair or do we move forward? Do we just open up the conversation a little more? And I, I would love to just start with opening up the conversation, being able to discuss these uh, these things that have happened without the necessarily necessary guilt or you know um, placement of blame, just recognizing it as our as our past and where do we go from here like Anne said like language is a uh, art is the language that everybody understands so i think getting on the same page would be our primary goal for you know for the for the future thank you for that nick i'll ask the same thing for you as we wrap up our conversation here um, yeah, I, I just um, just once again just express my gratitude to be a part of this. Um, thank you, you know, William, David, Renee, um, Ann, Windows. Hope to hopefully get to meet you all in person one day. Um, but uh, I just, I guess, you know, my thought is just taking it back to the beginning and just stressing the importance of um, art as as therapy, art as as a healing mechanism. Um, you know, for individual artists, you know, for those who we take that title as an artist, um, for those who work in the arts, you know, I think. You know, we're all just individuals who I think, you know, see the world in a certain way and, and feel in, in a deeper way than maybe what considered average or normal. And um, I think, you know, in, in these moments, you know, particularly like COVID, it's like really thinking about um, how we're all battling with things. You know, we're all um, experiencing these um, issues of the world in different ways. And, and we all have different ways of healing ourselves. And just, I think, um, stressing the importance of just like, just checking up on, on people you love and, and, and sharing your love with people. And um, yeah, make, making, stressing the importance of, of art as, as one tool to do that. You know? Thank you so much um, for that, Nick. Well, uh, appreciative of everyone who's joined us today. I know that when our, when our host, Amy, um, ends it, it will feel rather abrupt. So I didn't want to miss the chance to remind everyone that tomorrow is the last day of Louisiana Contemporary. And thanks to our friends at Hellas Foundation. It um, is free and open to the public. And hope that you can see it. It's, um, it's a beautiful show. And I want to thank again Hellas Foundation for creating this gathering point. Um, it is therapy. It is our healing mechanism. Renee Morales, David Breslin, Ann Window, and Nick, thank you so much. And I do look forward to seeing you in person. Everyone be well. See you at the museum. All right. Bye, Chris.